get started. We have a guest speaker tonight that's uh, holding things up because he's at the back hugging necks. But I'm sure he'll make his way up here in a minute. Let me go over a few um, additions to our prayer list that we need to be sure and remember this evening. Chuck Begno has requested prayers for his niece's family. Her husband, Jefferson Parker, was killed in a four-wheel, four-wheeler accident earlier this week. He was about 40 years old, leaving behind his wife and three children. Uh, so let's, uh, they're in the Houston, Texas area. So let's remember that family. Also, let's uh, remember the family of Glenda Malone, who passed away in her funeral services were today. Uh, There's a a couple of events coming up. Uh, 4th of July, we'll have uh, Sundays and Sparklers. Uh, This will be after the evening services. Uh, Across at the face, we'll have uh, ice cream and then sparklers outside. So uh, bring your favorite uh, ice cream and topping. If you have time to spare, strike out with us and have a great time together as a church family. Uh, This will take place at the uh, Itawamba Thunder Bowl uh, in Fulton. This will be July the 11th from 1 to 2 p.m. The cost is nothing, um, but uh, please let Andrew Sweeney know if you plan to attend. And that's all the additions that I have at, at this time. And uh, as uh, we prepare to get started, we've got a song here, and then I'll just go ahead and and introduce, in case any of you forgot, this is Russell Smith. And uh, he's he's starting to look like me. I've always been his favorite person, and and, uh, so I'm, I'm proud of Russell. And the tall guy that's with him, that's actually Isaac. He is 16 now. But we're very proud to have uh, Russell with us uh, tonight. So uh, if you would, bow with me and we'll begin. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the beauty of it and the opportunity that we have to come here in the middle of the week and uh, uplift each other and to uh, encourage each other and to study from your word. We thank you so much for... uh, Russell and Rennie and Isaac and Brenna and and uh, the uh, work that he does in Kolioka. We thank you for giving him safe travels here this evening. Dear Lord, we ask that you be with uh, Miss Glenda's family at this time as they're they're grieving as as are we and our church family here for this loss. Dear Lord, we ask that you please uh, be with Chuck Begno's niece and her family at this time. Be with us as we study from your word this evening. Uh, We ask that you continue to love us and protect us and let your grace shine upon us. And dear Lord, we ask that you forgive us of all our sins and bring us back again uh, safely this coming Sunday. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We'll sing uh, two songs before Russell comes before us. I will enter his gates and then give thanks.
kind of feel like we ought to be doing the pickles. Something doesn't feel quite right. Maybe we should get pew packers down here. Hey, Brooks, how you doing? You got tall too, man. I'm doing this. Is that okay? Am I breaking any rules or traditions? Um, I'm more comfortable down here. Um, I don't know why, Carrie. I just am. You know what I mean? Um, good evening. Wow. Wow. Here's that moment. Okay, wow. Standing back in front of West Main. What a blessing. Boy, you look great. You've grown up. I like that beard. You're welcome, Ben. Good to see. Guys are your brother, man. Y'all look great. You're growing up too, Stixie. Great. <laughs> just a little bit. So proud of you. Your decisions in life. You just are just growing like you should be, and it's it's all good, Leslie. You know, it's just all good. Everybody's growing up. Hey, Monica. Good to see you. Good. Good to see you. Um, well, we're going to be talking about Paul tonight, and uh, I'll get into that in just a minute. Okay, I'll get into that in just a minute. Thank you. Um, hey, Doug. What are you doing over there? You're supposed to be over here. I mean, it's so weird. Three and a half years later, he's not where he's supposed to be. I'm leaving. What are you doing? And now he's an elder. What the world? Wow. Man, man. It's good to be back. Isaac, is that right? Good to be back. Good to be visiting. We have fed Isaac. He has grown up. Uh, we pulled in and I said, Isaac, why don't you tell me how to get to West Main from here? He said, um, well, it's been a while. Um, let's see, uh, turn here maybe, I think. He did. I said, no, this is your hometown. This is where you were born. We brought you home down this road and brought you to the house there next to Debbie. We're neighbors of Debbie. He was like, yeah, I guess so. And we came here in 03. Brenna was eight months old. And that little girl just graduated high school. And uh, Isaac's driving. So, yeah, it happens, right? It happens. Hi, Steve. Becky. I'm just going to say hi all night, okay? <laughs> Can I just say hi all night to everybody that I see? Wow, this is great. How are you doing, Mr. Howard? Look at you guys. You're great. Man. Um, yeah, we're at Maywood this week. Uh, Rennie uh, was, the whole plan all week was to, hey, here we're going. And Brenna's like, I don't know. I kind of like my friends here. I, wanna, I don't get to see them much. I didn't see them last year. I was, was like, I want to go to West Maine. And uh, we're at camp, and so I went up the hill, and I said, hey, get Rennie. Where's Rennie? Is she coming tonight? And she was asleep. She says, I'm going to regret it. I know later, but I'm beat. And we've had a great week of camp. I've seen many little ones here roaming the hills, and some of them have said, this little boy looked at me with hair. Like, here's Ben. He said, I said you know who I am? I said, now, who are you? You don't remember me? And I thought, I got that feeling, you know, I got that feeling. Like, who? Who is this? I'm Keegan. I went, Keegan, wow. Keegan Wood, you're all grown up, man. And saw Gage, have, have been around, just so many. Um, it's been really cool kind of catching up and, and seeing them. So my topic tonight um, was given to me about a year ago, actually. I was supposed to come last summer, and then something happened with everybody's schedule. It didn't work out. Um, and... Um, <laughs> And so I appreciated Nathan calling again about in January asking me to come and uh, the same topic and I appreciate the topic. The topic that was given me for tonight and all this time was leadership principles in the life of Paul. So I don't know if that's right or not. He's not here anymore. So if it's not right, we can blame him. But that's what I'm going with. Okay. Leadership principles in the life of Paul. Now I will be honest and transparent in this. A lot of times when we think about leadership we think about church leadership. And a lot of times these kind of sermons or these kind of classes, I don't know what this is. I may make this a class. I don't know, Chuck, if that's okay. We think about elders. And sometimes we think about these lessons. We think, well, these are things the elders should be doing, right? Leadership principles, deacons, ministers, things like But that's not really what was given to me tonight. And that's not really when we read Paul's writings. We're going to spend some more time in Corinthians, Romans. That's not really what Paul is doing, addressing elders, he's addressing the church. And I got to thinking about it, and I thought, you know, if you're a Christian, you're a leader. You're showing the world the way to Christ. So leadership principles in the life of Paul, that's to every one of us. And we read about Paul, and we read some really, man, Paul was an intense guy. He was he was the guy. He was, 
the Hebrew of Hebrews, and then he was the persecutor, right? And then the Christian, the apostle. And Paul seems pretty, to be a pretty intense fella, pretty serious. And sometimes we say, well, that's Paul. I can never be like Paul, Carrie. That's Paul. But was Paul Jesus? It wasn't Jesus, was he? Paul was a man. So Paul gives us great leadership, great qualities for our lives, for you and I, for our lives. Not to look at it and say, oh yeah, this is what they ought to do. We ought to look at this topic and think, man, I, I look at this topic and I'm kind of humbled and I'm kind of scared because I think that's what I need to do. And that's what we all need to do. And we need to pay attention to what Paul's talking about. A lot of great things. So I have three or four, but I really want to spend time uh, the clock's gone. All right, now, wh who has moved the clock? <laughs> it didn't work anyway. Is that why I always went over? I don't know. Um, so I don't know where we are on time. Um, I'll hear a buzzer. Okay, 30 minutes, 32 minutes. I need to get going. A couple things. Um, I've been thinking about this, and I, I teach Romans and 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians uh, throughout the school year, and so I've kind of been making notes, kind of thinking, oh, that'd be something good to bring out. That'd be... For that lesson, it went, that would be something great about Paul, leadership. So several things, and I just want to kind of run through these. Um, so I invite you to turn to Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 5 first. Romans chapter 9, 1 through 5. Boy, this is deep. This is great. It was said one time, it, if Romans ever get you, if you ever get Romans, the Romans will get you. I've heard that said. Boy, does it, right? Boy, does it. Paul is grieving. He's grieving his fellow kinsmen, the Jews. All through early chapters of Romans, we understand the story of the Romans had access to God. Not the Romans, the, the, the Hebrews, the Jews, had every advantage. They had access to God. They had the very oracles of God. They were God's chosen people. They had every benefit of coming into Christ to do exceedingly well. You know, you knew all about God, now here you are in Christ. You have every reason to do extra great, right? But they didn't do that. They didn't do that. It's the, it's the Gentiles that are grafted in, that are brought in to God's people. And so Paul grieves the Jews. He grieves his fellow kinsmen, he says, and he's hurting. And he says in Romans 9, 1 through 5, he says, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and increasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. He says, they're Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law. It all belongs to them, he says, the worship, the promises. To them belong the patriarchs. And from their race, according to the flesh, is, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. He says, listen, they were the very people that Christ came from. And don't miss, don't miss, please don't miss. Let's not miss this. Verse 2, I have sorrow and anguish in my heart because they're not responding like he hoped they would respond. They're not responding like God hoped they were, would respond. They're not responding like the Messiah would hope that they responded. And then verse 3 is the first principle for us tonight. Paul says something pretty brave. And I got to tell you, when I read this, the first time I really looked at it, I was like, man, you got to be kidding. Right? Paul says something in verse 3. Don't miss this. Okay? This will change your heart for the lost, I think, if we can finally get and understand this verse. He says, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and caught off, cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers. What did Paul just say? Let me stop. Somebody raise their hand and tell me, what did Paul just say? Lost. Mississippi terms, what did he say? Lost. I would be what? Lost. lost. Is that what he says? Jolene, that's what he says. I would, let's get real simple here. Paul says if it meant that I could, would have to go to hell for my kinsmen, for my Jews, for them to be saved, Paul says I'd do it. Would you go to hell for anybody? That's a great question to come in on, right? Would you go to hell for anybody? That's hard. Everybody, amen. That's hard, right? That's hard. So what's Paul saying? Paul's saying, listen, I love the lost. 
He says that I, I would be willing to lose my soul for them if it meant that they came back to God. That's leadership, right? That's leadership. That's something that I need to work on. I, I need, to, I need to, to hurt for the lost and love the lost so much that, that I would be willing to give myself up. I mean, that, if it were possible, Paul's talking about his love for them. I mean, he, he's grieving. These are his people. So I just want to say that leadership in our life means that I need to lead, all right? I need to love the lost so much. If he's willing to do that, if possible, then what am I willing to do? For the lost. Think about that. You draw your own little paragraph in there if you want. What will you do for the lost? How far are you willing to go that someone in your family might come to Christ? How far are you willing to go that they come to the Lord? What are you willing to give up? That's a painful statement. That's a hurting statement to me. It's a great, beautiful statement. It's beautiful. That's, that's love for the lost, isn't it? Gary, that's love for the lost. I love them so much. And sometimes I think maybe I don't love the lost enough. Maybe sometimes I think I'm lost in my world and things are great in my world. and They're the lost and they have the same advantage as I had. They can make the same decisions I made. Go for it, guys. Here I am. I'm in good shape. But that's not a leadership principle from the life of Paul. That's selfish. That's not agape love. I love the lost. We need to love the lost. Yes, even to great points, right? Acts chapter 26. Let's move on a little bit. I want to spend a lot of time on the third one. I don't know if I'm going to get to or not. Let's go through this. I'll try to be quick here. Acts 26, 24 through 25. Paul's before Agrippa here. Festus is there. As he was saying these things in his defense, Acts 26, 24, and 25. Festus said with a loud voice, now Paul's defending himself. You're standing before Agrippa, you're on trial, you really want to go to Rome, you have a lot of great, what you I mean, listen, I've done nothing wrong, it's kind of like Job, I've done nothing wrong, right? I want to go to Caesar, I'll, I'll defend myself, and then man, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, are you, you're out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking true and rational words. What if you and I learned so much in God's word and we were so convicted by the word of God that people in this community and our neighbors and the people that we work with looked at us and thought that we had lost our minds? You mean you really believe all of that? Where does it say that in the Bible? Well, it's, it says to do that. That's how it's, really? How well do we know God's word? Do we spend time in God's word? I think a leader, a leader of a family, a leader of a Bible class, a leader of a neighborhood, a leader of a church, whatever it is that you're leading, you have an opportunity to make people think you've lost your mind. You're so serious about the Word. You read this all the time. You really don't have to do that, you know, David. You don't have to open your Bible all the time and read it wherever you go. You really don't have to do that. Why are you doing that? Because once you get in it and it gets a hold of you, you don't want to let it go. You want to know more. You want people to think you're crazy. Why? Because the love of God is pretty crazy. It's pretty crazy. I still have not been able to fathom, and maybe this is a shortfall of mine, why, Brooks, God loved me so much. I don't know. I mean, really, you know, you ever thought about that? I don't know why. I get all the Bible answers, Carrie. I get it. I get all that. I get all that. But still, the human Russell, little Russell side is kind of like, I still don't, why me? Why did he send his, why did he send his son from the throne room of heaven? Right? Before time, before anything, there he is. Everything's created through him. The plan is to send him down to redeem mankind. And he cares for me. And he cares for you. And he cares for everyone, Linda. He cares for everyone. He loves everyone so much. Is it, doesn't it make sense that I learned about that story? Doesn't it make sense that I understand maybe complicated teachings? I think sometimes that we all fall guilty in living in the land of milk, spiritual milk. Paul would want us to grow up into this land of spiritual meat. It's great to know the simple basic principles in God's word, but you know what I've learned and what you've learned in time, what we've all learned is there's more. 
There's more. The church in Corinth got stuck in the, in, in the milk. He says, look, you should be in the meat now, but you're still in the meat. You're still in the milk. You should be understanding big things, but you're still in the simple things. So we need to grow. How do we grow? We grow by getting in the Word. We get in the Word and people say, you've lost your mind. And we say, what? Amen. You got that right. Amen. I've lost my mind. I get into the Word of God. So let's move on here. Um, no way I'll get all this in. Um, I'll talk fast. Um, <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 8 through 10 and 1 Corinthians 12 and 13. All right, I'm not going to read all of that, okay? I'm not going to read all that. So go home and read that tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, 9 and 10 and 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I want to talk about agape love. You know, agape is one of those words... Our love is one of those words, when we open up our Bible and we read the word love, it's kind of unfortunate, I think, I think it's kind of unfortunate, that so many different ways to describe these different ideas are translated into one word, love. The great, I think, word for love, the kind of love that God loves us with is agape love. There's brotherly love, there's all these kind of loves, but the, the one love is agape love. It's what Paul's talking about in, in, to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 13. That's what he's preaching about in chapters 8 through, 8 through 10. It's agape love. And it's this kind of love that, 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 that really when we're faced, when we have it and when we show it, it shows itself in that we give ourselves away for each other. It gives ourselves, we give ourselves away for each other. The issue in chapters 8 through 10 is that in Corinth, there are pagan temples. And in these temples, there are dining halls. And what is happening is that these Jews that are brought in and converted into Christ, now they don't carry the burden of the law, really. And now there are freedoms, there are liberties that they can enjoy because they are in Christ. Things that the Bible doesn't say, you can, you can't, you have liberties, things you can do. And so they're learning about these liberties. And one of those liberties is that in these pagan temples, meat is offered. A third of the meat goes, is burnt up. A third goes to the priest and, and to the market. And then the priest gets the benefit out of that. And the community gets to buy some of the meat. And so there's this big deal over the meat, right? And it's just meat. And Paul says, look, you stronger Christians, you, you more mature Christians know you have this knowledge that there's nothing wrong with eating the meat. You know that really there's nothing even wrong intrinsically, technically, with even eating in the dining halls because we know, Paul says, that there are no such things as these gods. We know that those are just buildings and that's just food. But the reality is, and some of them are doing that, they're going to these places and they're eating the meat and they're, 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 they're enjoying the meat and lesser knowledge Christians, weaker Christians, more on milk, on the milk end of things, are seeing that and they're being drawn into to, to the temple to enjoy these, this meat. And what's happening is, um, they are actually being drawn in, back in, they probably just came out of, back in to idol worship. And so the more mature Christian says, it's just meat, it's no big deal. The lesser Christian goes, oh, okay, it's not meat, it's just no big deal. Chapter 10, Paul says, really, what you're doing, the effect you're having on them, you ought to be communing with Christ. There ought to be a oneness with Christ in you, but because your effect, because of your arrogance in what you know, you're actually having a negative effect on the weaker Christian, and they're stumbling, you're making a shipwreck of their faith, by taking liberty that you can take. And Paul says, give that away. You have the right to do this, yes, but in fact, you're causing them to stumble. You're causing trouble in their life. Have agape love, he says. I know that we don't have temples. I know we don't have idols, but I think that we have idol meat issues, right? I think we have idol meat issues. I think that there are some things that you and I can do. Well, I can do that, no big deal. They can get over it. But I think a lot of times that's where we stop. And Paul, leadership principle he gives us is to give ourselves away for other people. Give ourselves away for other people. I can go here and I can do that and I can wear this and say that. We say, well, surely other people are not my responsibility. They, they can figure it out. They, 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 they know what's right and wrong. They can figure it out themselves just like I did. Paul says, that's not the leadership principle Paul says I'm giving you. Paul says... Don't do it. 
don't make an issue about this and cause them to stumble. In chapter 10, one of the other issues is that they're taking the meat into their home and eating the meat and serving it. If I were to invite you over and say, hey, come over, we're gonna have roast from, we're gonna have roast after church. You walk in, Carrie says, okay, great, where did the meat come from? Paul says, look, if they ask, and if, if the meat's gonna bother them, right? If it's really gonna bother them to eat that meat and it's gonna cause them to stumble and maybe they don't understand what you understand and maybe they, they're kind of hung up on that. Paul says, then don't serve the meat to them. Find something else. He says, but if they don't care, if they don't ask where the meat's from, just serve the meat. It's just meat. But in this weird kind of thing that we kind of dig into, and I know we don't have a whole lot of time to unpack that, but those three chapters, Paul is asking the church to give up their liberties for other Christians. And what we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 is that Paul says, I'm willing to run the same race that you're running. Paul says, I have the right to be paid as a minister. I have the right to, to be married. I have rights, but I'm giving those up for you. I don't want to be a burden to you, and I don't want me taking advantage of my liberties to stumble you. I'm running the same race you are, and I'm asking you to give up things that you can have, that you can do, for the people. Now, use your imagination. I mean, I don't have, I mean, what, what, are, what are the idle meat issues? We don't have idle meat. What are the things? What are the things that we think about? And maybe selfishly we think, you know, I'm good with that. I can do that. No problem. But what effect is that having on somebody who doesn't know what we know? Are we mindful of each other? Do we have agape love? And agape love is just a great thing, I think, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We dive into that and we find this church, that their Sundays, I promise you, look a lot different than our Sundays. We're talking about miraculous gifts. We're talking about a lot of things going on in worship that we would look at and go, that ain't right. If we were to walk in there and we go, that's exactly right. That's exactly what God wanted then. That's what he was doing. And so they were kind of arguing over gifts. I can translate. I can speak languages. I can, I can um, you know, I, I, I can heal. You know, I have this gift that Paul gave. I can do these wonderful things. And they were kind of, you know, comparing their gifts Hey, your gift to translate is pretty cool, but I can heal. I, I can speak. I can, I can prophesy, Chuck. I can speak the very words of God without studying. I think my gift's greater than your gift. And they're going back and forth. There's no love in Corinth, right? And Paul says, I'm going to show you something more excellent. In other words, if these gifts are going to go away, I mean, let me ask you a question. If, if God has all these miraculous gifts working in the early church and he takes them away, what do you think he would give them in their place? What would he give in their place? What's greater? He would say in 1 Corinthians 13 at the end, these three remain, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest is what? It's love. So I want you to think about this. I want to um, go to 1 Corinthians 13. I was going to put this on the screen, but I wasn't really exactly sure how to get that here, get that to you. So I want you to open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 as we think about love. I think the Lord's church needs love. I think that leaders show love. And I think this may be, in fact, the greatest leadership principle that we can learn from the life of Paul. I really do. I think there are a lot there, and there are a lot more than I've even talked about tonight. I think this is the greatest one. Paul says, you know, a lot of things are in 1 Corinthians 13. I can do a lot of wonderful things. I have faith to move mountains. If I can do all these wonderful but if I do them and I don't have love, what does he say? Somebody help me out. If I have the faith that moves mountains, if I do this, I do that, I can do all these wonderful things, but I do them without love behind them, then what does he say? I am nothing. It's a clanging gong, a cymbal. Anybody here to love just when somebody goes, Shh, drop a cymbal in the band hall, you, you band people, that is just a nerve-wracking noise. Paul says, if, if, if we are doing Christian things and there's not love behind those things, they're just kind of annoying. They're just not really working, my words. It's a clanging gong, a clanging cymbal. It's just nothing. Love, is there love behind what we do? Is there love behind us? Are we loving people? Are we showing love through our actions? Are we giving ourselves away for other people? Do I love you so much, even though I might understand an issue more than you, that I back down until you're able to come to knowledge that I have, and then we can move on? That's love. That's love. So how, do we, how are we doing with love. Do we have love? Would you look in your Bibles there in 1 Corinthians chapter 13? I just call this the self-test of love. And what I want you to do is I want you to look at verse 4. 
I want you to read this with me all the way to the start of verse 8. Paul's defining love. He's telling us what love is. He's explaining it a little bit. And he says that um, love, well, love is patient and kind. He says love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Doesn't that sound beautiful? We all want to be loved. Raise your hand if you want to be loved like that. Right? I want to be loved like that. A lot of times, young married couples, even older married couples, dating couples, have struggled with figuring this love thing out. And it's like, you know, I'm so mad. You know, this is like Rennie earlier. I'm so mad, Russell, you are, you're walking in the house your dirty shoes on. Leave them at the door. I say, you know, I really like Pillsbury cinnamon rolls. You never cook those. Anybody else like Pillsbury cinnamon rolls? I say, you know, I, that's what I really want. So why don't you start making Pillsbury cinnamon rolls and I'll start leaving my shoes at the door. And she says, I'll start leaving, I'll start cooking you cinnamon rolls when you start leaving at the door. And, I'm, and we go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I want to be loved. That's what we say, right? I want to be loved. You love me. You make my cinnamon roll. You leave your shoes at the door. And we get all angry. There's no love. We go, What's going on here? And what we're looking for selfishly is that we think love is kind of like a reward. If I show love, I get love. <laughs> If I show love, I get love. Is that the way it works? It may not be. But agape love is a love that gives, whether it's returned or not. Rennie would say, I'm going to make you cinnamon rolls every morning with love in my heart. Whether you put your shoes up or not, I'm going to make cinnamon rolls. And that's so hard, isn't it? Because we think, you know, I want to be shown love. I'm not going to start showing love until I see that you're really in this. But, you know, with love, it's one of those things, even in a church family, we have to show understanding. We, we might not get it back. There might be a member I'm struggling with. There might be some issue. But I, and my job is to love whether they show the love back. That's leadership. I'm leading by love. So what I want you to do now is I want you to look back at the same passage we just looked at. I just want you to do a little self-test here. A little self-test here. Anytime you see the word love in what we just read, or anytime you see something that is talking about love, in other words, it, that's talking about love, I want you to draw a blank there and I want you to put your name in that verse. So if you've got your Bibles open, I'm going to be quiet for a minute and I want you to take the self-test. You are love. How are you doing? Read verses 4 through the beginning of 8. And put your name where it's talking about love. Is it working on you a little bit? If it is, say amen, it is. Yeah, it's kind of working on me a little bit too. I'm reading it again. I'm thinking, whoa, <laughs> I'm in trouble here. Russell is not resentful. Russell is not boastful. My toes are hurting, Carrie. Chuck, I'm hurting down here. I'm preaching to my words, working on me, thinking what's going on here. How did you do? Did you pass the love test? We read that and we put our name in and we ask the question, am I really agape love? I want that kind of love. My church family, I want that kind of love for my friends, for my family, for my neighbors. We all want that kind of love. But are we going to have to wait to receive that love to be that love? Does it depend? Is it conditional? 
Is that the love that we see from Christ? Oh, yeah, I'll die for your sins. But look, you need to get right, Vicky. What does it say in Romans 5, 8, Gary? Put you on the spot, I love that. Romans 5, 8. What's he say? Watch him work. You, I love it. 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 Right. Read it. Read it. Read it. Read it. You're all on it. Yeah, you're right there with it. Wait, stop. God loved us when? While we're still sinners. It's impossible for God to love us when we get things right. <laughs> right? He loved us even when he knew that we might not make him cinnamon rolls. He loved us even when he knew that I might leave my shoes at the door. He loved me even though I am a sinner. Unconditional, probably unrewarding love because what does the Bible say? Matthew says, few are those, but many who don't, right? Most of mankind won't return that kind of love to God. Did that stop God from giving me that kind of love? But yet there's the example. There it is in Paul's life in 1 Corinthians 8, 9, and 10 and chapter 9 where he said, listen, I, I'm willing to do the very things I'm asking you to do. Lay aside your selfish ways for yourselves and put those aside for one another. The liberties that you can enjoy in Christ, I'm asking you to put those on hold and think about the less mature Christians who are still learning and still growing and, and might be confused and you might make a shipwreck of their faith. I'm willing to do that for you because, think Paul sitting here, he's showing us leadership because Christ did it for us. He died for us while we were still perfect. Jimmy, is that what he says? Anybody here perfect? Anybody here got it figured out? Duke, you got it figured out? You made a lot of people in the community. Everybody, anybody's got it figured out. If anybody in this, in this congregation has met anybody in this community, it's got it figured out. Duke, I'm putting it on you because you know a lot of people. You ever met anybody that's got it figured out? You're kidding, right? In Tupelo, Mississippi, and all the people you know, nobody's got it figured out. How about in this church? Anybody in this church got it figured out? We perfect by ourselves and what we do? No, no. We're perfect, made perfect because of Christ. Because of his love. Because he shared that love with us. Because he showed that love to us. I think that may be the most powerful, possibly um, the most powerful leadership principle that Paul could share with us and can show us in his life because he knows and depends on the love of Christ. All right, I'm trying to find one other point here. Isn't that great, Russell? I had it all together. There's one point that is right somewhere. Maybe that's it. You ever run into this sometimes? Maybe that's it. I'll tell you a great story. Let me do this because we've only got a few minutes. I'll tell you a great story. I, I, I love the people at Kalioka. I love you and I love the people at Kalioka. Kalioka, raise your hand if you visited me, right? Do I make a big deal out of you when you come? I brag about the dirt on your tires, don't I? I say, Tennessee folk, one of my elders said, I said, listen, y'all some good dirt. Go out there and get off the Mississippi tires. Jimmy, not missing the beat, said, well, you know where that dirt washed down from, don't you? The flood, you're right. It kind of went down to Mississippi, probably from here, Jimmy. You're right, yeah. Yeah, probably so. But we were talking about love, and this Sunday we were talking about bearing one another's burdens in Galatians chapter 6. And um, in our class, we, we've, got a, we've got one of our members, his name is Jamie Hines, and Jamie... Uh, it was about my age, but Jamie, when he was born, was born with a cord around his neck. He's a little bit slower, a little bit behind. And I love it when, 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 when somebody makes a great point and, man, just, just gets it. We're talking about burdens and stepping into the lives of one another. You know, when we struggle, we, we get trapped in sin. And we get caught up in, this, in, in each other's lives trying to help each other out. And then Jamie, you know, we, we talked about that this week, and Jamie made this great connection Sunday. And, he's, and, and when he talks, you know, we all know to listen because it's probably something pretty good. And it, boy, it was. 
Because the week prior, we had been talking about agape love. We talked about burdens this past Sunday, and he said, we can share, we can help each other with our burdens, but if we don't do it with love, he looked at me like that, and I went, wow. Love's got to be in our heart all the time, doesn't it? Helping each other, caring for each other, whatever, love. And I thought, he's got it. Love. Is love behind anything and everything I do for my Christian brothers and sisters? Is it behind my life? That's the one I need to follow. Let me stop. Is, that, is there another bell or is that one more bell? Okay, so I don't know how you do it every Wednesday tonight. I'm not going to get in trouble because I don't work here. If it's a class, usually, or somebody just talks the whole time, I'd like to open it up for your comments or thoughts. I know we've touched on some pretty deep things in Scripture, and I, I know that there are probably some great thoughts, some great comments or questions even. And if I can't answer them, Chuck's here. <laughs> Maybe just have something you want to add to class. How are we doing with some of these principles? Not as good as we should, right? And this isn't a beat us up class, Duke. We get that, right? This is a, we're, we're trying to grow. We're trying to learn. I am. Right. That's right. We're not perfect. And that's, that's kind of the same point that Paul makes in Galatians 6. He comes out of Galatians 5 talking about the fruit of the Spirit, being spiritual people, and being spiritual people enough to help each other with our spiritual burdens, those who are caught in Christ. He says, listen, be careful because you may not be caught in their burden that they're caught in. You might not be caught in the sin you're caught in. You could still find yourself in a situation because you have arrogance and you think, well, I've got all that figured out. Right? That's right, that's right, that's right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, I think we talked about all these qualities that are listed here. There's probably one or more that stands out in each individual. Yeah. And I'll cry, not cry, I'll confess that mine is the patience. Right. Monica's shaking her head, okay, so I'm just. <laughs> no, I'm, 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 I'm bring that up because Alina's not here tonight. Because that's what when Monica asked her one time, why will you mind daddy when you won't mind me? Right. And she said, because daddy has no patience. No patience. I thought at that time it was a pretty good one. But that, you know, that's something I think we should. The, the self test kind of hurts, right? It, it works on us a little bit. And that, there may, that's a great point. There may be one thing that really, we need to really work on one of those. Maybe there are more, but there may be really one, and what are we doing? Anybody else? I'll be quiet and sit down. I love you all. Thank you very much. Um, I know that the, um, the gospel is beautiful. Um, the story of Jesus is beautiful. And I know that uh, we're in a room of people who have obeyed the gospel, who have um, been obedient by faith, who have uh, demonstrated that through the obedience in the gospel, Romans 6 through, through 5, and you have put sin to death in your life, you've trusted in Christ. But even in that, does it make us mistake free? Maybe we need struggles, we, we need prayers for our struggles, maybe we um, need encouragement. I don't know what you need. Maybe you don't need that, maybe you just need to think about love like I do. Maybe you just need to do better like I do. But maybe you're here tonight, you're not a Christian. And we talked about the love of Christ, and maybe that's something that appeals to you. Maybe that's something that you've considered, or maybe that's something you've been talking to somebody here about. I don't know your story, but you may have a need. And I think we're going to send an invitation song. Is that right? So James is going to come lead us in the song of invitation. If you have any need, please let that need be known. We're a loving family. We're not judging. We hurt, we are broken, and we share, and we want to be there for you. Please come while we stand and we sing.
Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this day and for the opportunity we've had to come together to sing praises in thy name and to hear another message from thy word. We pray, Father, that each and every one of us would take the principles that have been laid out for us tonight. May we apply them to our lives and may we show love to a greater extent than we have in the past to all those around about us and to our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're thankful, Father, for thy son. We're thankful for the great sacrifice that he did make makes it all possible for us to be here today to worship thee, the true and the living God. Pray, Father, that I will continue to bless those who are bereaved at this time, be with those who are sick in need of our prayers. Forgive us of our sins and bring us back the next appointed time. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>